Well, it's been a year of big returns in the market from Diwali of last year. The Nifty is up 43% and the mid-caps have surged 70% in the same period. But what is the outlook going forward and which are the sectors which still give you comfort in terms of valuations and steady, stable growth? Uh, and this is as we head into somewhat 2078. We have a special guest on the show, Mohamed Apabai, is Managing Director, Head Asia-Pacific Trading Strategies at Citigroup. Uh, Mr. Ababai, great to have you here. Thank you very much, Prashant, this side. Are we entering, after an uninterrupted, straight, linear run, are we entering a period of a little bit of risk-off for a variety of reasons? Uh, the top one being uh, that uh, interest rates seem to be, or maybe financial conditions seem to be tightening a little bit precisely at the point where growth around the world in the large markets is starting to taper off. Your thoughts? Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for uh, having me uh, on your show. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I think your, uh, your, your question is a, a really excellent one. I think this is uh, the question that we have also been uh, grappling with. I've been basically bullish uh, on markets and on risk assets since uh, about March 2020, and what we've been arguing is that equity markets would, and risk assets in general would continue rallying uh, while central banks would continue providing liquidity. And that has pretty much happened uh, for, for pretty much the last uh, 18 months. What is now happening is that the central bankers are starting to turn and change their views. But even though they're changing their views and they're talking about interest rates, all of these things are still another six months away. So when you're looking at that provision of liquidity, it's going to continue at least until February, March 2020, 2022. And it's really the second quarter of 22 uh, that we are a lot more concerned about. Okay, got that. Uh, Apabai, uh, thank you for being with us on the show and greetings of the season to you and your entire team at City. For emerging markets like India, what according to you is the biggest risk to this rally now? Well, I think the biggest risk is uh, really monetary tightening. Um, there's sort of uh, two risks that I can see for India. One is that we continue to be uh, bullish uh, broadly on the, uh, on the oil price. Um, I, in a very bullish scenario, we wouldn't be surprised to see uh, $99 uh, on, uh, on Brent crude. That's not the core scenario, but that's certainly a trading uh, view that uh, that could happen. But I think the biggest risk that you have is really uh, following a period of uh, relatively loose monetary policy, especially in India, um, what you start seeing is tighter monetary policy. And here what I would do is draw the parallels between India and China, um, you know, the two big superpowers uh, in uh, our region. And really when we're looking at, at uh, China, what has been the problem for the Chinese equity market so far this year? But I think really, I call it the four horsemen of the bear market. And the four horsemen are really the uh, monetary policy, which has been tighter in China compared to India. Uh, the virus policy in uh, China has been basically a zero uh, COVID strategy compared to India, where things were very bad, but it appears that things are uh, opening up a lot more. Uh, the third is regulatory risk. And in China, of course, we've seen a lot more regulatory risk than uh, in, we have in India. And the fourth one is now uh, systemic risk, uh, which is more seen in, in China and India. And that really, what that does is it gives you the framework uh, for looking at the market. So if, for example, you get a resurgence of COVID, unfortunately, uh, or you get uh, particularly tighter monetary policy, uh, we think that would be negative. But again, we don't see that happening until at least the first quarter of 2022. So for the time being, uh, things we think are going to be OK. Second quarter of 22, we might be looking at something like a 15.2% correction in the main headline S&P level, uh, which will be actually negative for global equities uh, across the world. But again, the point is we've got still more upside before we get to that uh, potential correction period. All right. Since we're talking about risks, just to follow up here, how much of a concern is the inflationary pressures that India Inc. has faced because of the rise in raw material prices, especially energy and commodity costs? Do you think that could be a reason that could put a lid on the market gains in future? 
Well, I think that, uh, you know, when you're looking at Indian, when I'm looking at Indian inflation, uh, what I actually see is a picture of relatively subdued uh, inflationary pressures. I mean, when you have uh, US CPI at 5.2%, then India at around 5% on its CPI doesn't actually uh, look uh, that bad. And I think, um, yes, there are inflationary pressures, there are supply chain uh, issues. Uh, again, we believe that these are relatively short term. We think that they are relatively uh, transient. Um, you know, the market in the US, for example, is factoring in something like two or three rate hikes uh, within the next uh, 18 months, which we think is going to be too high. And already the U.S. term structure is starting to twist a little bit and is starting to flatten, um, which shows that the economy is not uh, able to take uh, that level of interest rate hike. So I think there is going to be some inflationary pressure. Um, but I think as COVID, uh, the effects of COVID start to uh, normalize, uh, we think that a lot of those inflationary pressures are relatively short term. Um, we'll have to see whether they actually take hold uh, in the economy. But I think this is a good time for governments as they're coming out of COVID to manage the uh, fiscal constraints, the budgetary constraints. Uh, you always want to be mending the roof uh, when the sun is shining or when things aren't as bad as what you projected because you never know when, when, when things are going to get uh, worse again. Uh, so again, uh, you know, we think that in, uh, in, in 22, uh, things would be a lot clearer. But actually, um, I quite like, I, I quite like um, the U.S. break-even inflation rates here. Um, I think they're a little bit overdone in terms of the inflation concern. My view is that within 12 months, we're probably going to be looking, within 12 months, we're probably going to be looking at disinflationary pressures again uh, in the global economy. Mm. You know, the, uh, just to take that point forward, the short-term interest rate market in the U.S., uh, Ms. Ababai, is projecting three hikes in 22. Uh, it, the Fed uh, has, in a, in a way, implicitly told us that there is no rate hike till the taper is done. Uh, so what is the market telling us? I mean, should we pay attention to it? Or do you think, I mean, these will fade away? As you said, I mean, you're not worried about break-even break -even inflation. And maybe the market comes around to the view as well. Yeah, I think I think that's very possible. I mean, it's sort of um, three, three rate hikes within uh, 22 uh, basically means that the Fed has pretty much lost control of the inflation curve, at least in, uh, in the very short term. And what that would mean is that the supply uh, issues, because that's really what we are seeing. We're seeing some wage uh, pressure. And a lot of it is about, um, you know, basically ships being in the wrong place, uh, the not enough workers uh, on a particular mine, uh, you know, supply issues uh, similar to that. And of course, you have the supply issues coming again from China as a result of, uh, of COVID. Now, it really depends on how quickly and efficiently uh, the market will be able to uh, iron out those, uh, those issues. And we think that, you know, the supply chains will, will start working a lot more efficiently again uh, in 2022. I think the fundamental picture underneath uh, everything that is going on is still pretty much the same. We're still living in a fairly disinflationary environment. Um, and remember, with China, the Chinese economy is going to be slowing down uh, fairly substantially, we think, in uh, the rest of uh, 2021. And we're watching to see what the impact of that is going to be, especially from the property sector in 2022. But that could potentially have uh, a, a global uh, impact. And the real concern that we have is uh, one of stagflation, uh, where, as you highlighted, um, that what happens is that growth slows down, but uh, inflation picks up. But if you look at what happened in the bond market, even over the last 48 hours, as the growth projections start coming down, what you actually find is that the bond yields also start coming down. So we're actually looking for an opportunity to go long bonds uh, once again, especially uh, into the first quarter of, uh, of 22. So you can see the picture that I'm trying to paint here. The rest of this year is going to be pretty much like what the first nine months of this year has, uh, has been like, or 10 months of the year has been like. It's going to continue for probably the next uh, two to three months. Right. Uh, and then it's really going to be at the end of uh, the first quarter of 22 uh, that things will really change uh, quite significantly as we have to get used to 
living in a world without the central bank liquidity being provided. So a Q2 of 2022 is essentially <coughs> uh, is what you're watching. Industrial metals, uh, Mr. Alphabai, what's your view? And uh, what do you like the best there uh, from a slightly longer structural point of view? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because we've had actually a lot of questions, especially from the Indian client base, on exactly that. And, you know, I'm not a commodity specialist, um, but I think um, what has been uh, very interesting has been, you know, the way that we've responded to that question mm -hmm. is to say that you can't actually look at um, all the commodities in uh, the same space. So, for example, if you look at aluminium, until a few days ago, was looking massively overbought. And we know the reasons why that is, it was supply issues. Uh, it was also uh, to do with uh, electric vehicles and various other things. Uh, but then you look at iron ore, which is right at the bottom of the range. And again, we know uh, why, that is, uh, why that is happening. So overall, industrial metals will be following the general economic cycle, which is that generally a bullish view until um, the first uh, the first quarter of uh, 22 and then after that uh, it's probably uh, going to be a bit more of a concern the the place i think where there is actually the most opportunity either from the bull side or the bear side um, is actually in china because in china you know i'm still bearish i've been bearish on 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 that market for uh, a little while now maybe pro probably since uh, January of, uh, of or February of this year, and it does feel like there is one more leg down uh, to come. But that is really the place where uh, investors uh, should be uh, should be watching. Um, and I think in 22, uh, what we need to uh, watch out for mm -hmm. is going to be the point where the market becomes very concerned about growth. Maybe it's because uh, we'll be looking at uh, imminent rate hikes. But I think the point is that uh, from March 2020 until about March 2022, we stay long. And then at that point, uh, hopefully I can come back on your show if I'm invited again, and uh, we'll talk about uh, whether it's time to turn. But the projection for the S&P, for example, is for the market to reach uh, a level of 4 triple eight. So I'm not going to tell you just be bullish. I'm going to tell you sort of be bullish up to this level. Um, our numbers can't justify a level of the market above uh, that level. Uh, correspondingly, in India, the Nifty index should get to around 19,966, um, which is uh, around the, the sort of 20,000 mark. And what is interesting is that, you know, in, uh, in, Chi in, in the West, the 4888 number that I mentioned on the S&P is what they call an angel number. It's a time when you pause and you reflect on what's happened. And in uh, China, that number actually uh, signifies the end of getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. So um, there is some sort of poetic uh, rhyme that is, uh, that is there. And uh, certainly it's a number that you probably want to be writing down and uh, we'll be reviewing uh, as we get closer to the time. Okay, this is definitely music to the ears of the investors listening to you right now. The Nifty perhaps hitting that 19,966 levels. And you know what? You're always welcome on our shows. You just have to give us a time and we'll make sure you're there. So thank you so much for joining us. We can, we can, uh, we can actually uh, fix a time every, every week. <laughs> 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 Great to have you uh, with really us. Fun. Great to have you with us, Yam Sababai. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, season's greetings from all of us here at uh, CNBC TV 18. All right, uh, so that is a global view, an important one coming in across, I mean, uh, asset classes, and uh, very, very interesting. The market, I think, picked up a little bit from the day's low. We're at about 18,093, 117, 118 points low. We'll take a very quick break here. Uh, on the other side,